Hi guys, welcome back to the channel. Today's video is America dismantles pirate nations for touching their boats, the Barbary Wars. Okay, interesting. Um, I mean... No idea what that means. It makes sense. Americans just like, yeah, if you touch our boats, no chance. Yeah, no, 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 I don't mean that bit. I meant the Barbary, the Barbary Wars. Wars. I'm guessing that's just the name of it, you know what I mean? Okay. Like, I don't know... Um... Like, the Great Depression. It's just the name of the... Yes, yeah, it's not a war, but yeah. No, but like it's just the name of the, the name thing. of something, yeah, like a battle or war, or whatever. <laughs> you wouldn't come for me. I'm gonna sound so confused. It's fine. I, I didn't mean it was the same. I didn't mean it. Where did that come from? Smash that button. Smash that subscribe button. Are you ready? Yeah, it's like fast food restaurants, it's like a collective, isn't it? It's like the name. Do you get me? Cut this out. <laughs> Let's get into it, guys. We don't, we don't cut anything on this channel, so you see all. Oh. <laughs> ah, yes, that time that pirates kept messing with American ships, so George Washington founded the United States Navy to do something about it. Yeah, the United States Navy was founded for the sole reason oh, founded. of hunting pirates. Yeah, that's quite bad. Mm. Today we're talking about the Barbary Wars. Ladies this is and gentlemen, old school, it's pretty much an yeah. ongoing internet joke that you do not mess with America's boats. You know, because of Operation Praying Mantis, that time that America decided they were going to sink half of Iran's navy yep. in like eight hours. And and Vietnam, and and World War II, and World War One, and the Spanish-American War, and the War of 1812. Um, I guess if you're not picking up what I'm putting down, I'm trying to tell you, this is the origin story of why you don't mess with America's boats. Okay. But first, okay. a word from our sponsor, because this video is brought to you by my favorite underwear company, Sheath. Wait, hold on, I'm supposed to read a script for this one. Here's how to do a perfect ad read for our company. Let's take a quick second to thank our favorite sponsor for today's show, which is Sheath Underwear. Sheath makes the most comfortable boxer briefs ever worn, and Clarence's parents have a real good marriage. This shit's fucking lame. Okay, look, here's the deal. Whether you're talking to a veteran, a construction worker, or your dad, they're all gonna tell you that there's one universal truth to life, and that truth is that cargo pockets are fucking awesome. God damn right. If you think I mean we, we don't normally include ads, but we do a lot of pipe lectures and videos, so we leave them in there and he just doesn't care, does he? No. So he'll just throw anything in these, so we leave them in for that. Cargo reason. shorts are cool. Wait till you try cargo underwear, except the cargo pocket is made with balls not being stuck to your thigh technology. And I know what wow. you're thinking, but chubby electron guy, what if I try them out and I don't like it? Cool. Just wear them like normal underwear and then you have a bonus cargo pocket. Nobody in the history of mankind has ever been like, damn it! I have too many available cargo pockets. It's never happened. I think that is true. <laughs> cargo shorts are not even cute at all. First of all, cargo shorts are awesome. They always have been. Second of all, you know what you and this cargo pocket have in common? You don't feel either of us. <gasps> oh, that was good. That was a, a married. <laughs> well, at least I know who I'm not letting put their phone in my pocket next time we go somewhere. Anyways, <laughs> if you wanted to try some sheath cargo underwear for yourself or buy some as a gift for your significant other, I'll have them linked in the description down below. And you can use the discount code Fat Electrician for 20% off. Back to the you know, you'll get All right, here's the deal. For three centuries, pirates from the Barbary states of Morocco, Algiers, Tunis, and Tripoli would raid merchant vessels in the Mediterranean, steal all the goods, and imprison and turn all of the crew members into slaves. Oh, so wow. why was this allowed to go on for over 300 years? Well, the only navies powerful enough to stop these pirates at the time were the Spanish, the French, and the British. And they all came to the same conclusion that it would be cheaper to pay off the pirates, giving them a yearly tribute to not raid their ships rather than go to war with them so okay. now those three empires aren't getting their ships raided which is fine that's a good thing i guess but here's the catch with it that this. they may yeah. or may not have known at the time but they definitely figured out somewhere along the way now the pirates are only raiding all the smaller nations okay it's like Walmart, Target, and Amazon getting together, encouraging shoplifting, knowing that they can shoulder the financial burden, but it puts all the other mom and pop stores out of business and they become the only ones selling goods. Okay, Except instead yeah. of retail stores, we're talking about entire nations. This goes on for Which literally hundreds of years, yeah, but America is still part of the British Empire, so they fall under their umbrella of protection, so it's never an issue. That is mm -hmm. until the American Revolution started on April 19th, 1775, with the shot heard around the world, the Battle of Lexington and Concord, and the famous story of a 78 year old veteran going out into his front yard and shooting three redcoats as they retreated back to Boston, sending the message for all of America that the British Empire should get off of our lawn. Fast forward 1783, America wins the Revolutionary War, officially becoming its own country yeah. and all of America's mm -hmm. merchant vessels start flying the old red, white, and blue. And pretty much immediately, 1784, one of America's merchant vessels is captured by Barbary pirates from the country of Morocco. As an act of good faith for a new nation, Spain actually pays off the pirates gets the American vessel and all of its crew back, returns it to America, and then advises the American government, hey, 
you guys should start paying these guys off too. That's okay. what all the big nations are doing. At which point, America's minister to France, a guy by the name of Thomas Jefferson, chimes in and he's like, no, absolutely not. I'm going to go talk to him. Now, obviously, I'm okay, paraphrasing here, but basically, <laughs> Thomas Jefferson rolls up and he's like, hey, don't ever fuck with my boats ever again or else. At which point, the Sultan of Morocco is like, I'm sorry, who are you? I'm Thomas Jefferson, one of the founding fathers of America. You know, we just kicked the British out of our entire country. We're our own thing now. I'm sorry, you fucking pilgrims did what now? We beat the British in war and now we are our own country. You mean to tell me that a bunch of colonial farmers with muskets went toe to toe with the largest military on the planet that is so good at war that they can literally wear high vis red coats the entire time and still win and you beat them. Yeah, that's exactly what I'm telling you. I mean, yeah, I could probably just leave your boats alone from now on. That historically seems like it's going to be a really good idea. And that is the story of how Morocco came to be the first country to recognize America as its own sovereign nation by signing the Moroccan-American Treaty of Peace and Friendship, which is the first... I mean, it's a smart move, isn't it? I suppose, yeah. Like you say, but, I mean, it's mad to think how powerful Brits were back then. The British military and stuff yeah. like, it's completely different nowadays. It's a good job, we are friends. Uh, but I suppose if you beat them... How powerful are you? <laughs> yeah, to yeah, to like it's like someone coming to beat in America, it's like Yeah, but like, oh, 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 oh what the yeah. hell? Um so yeah, no, definitely very powerful. And the longest Already. lasting peace treaty in American history. At which point Thomas Jefferson is like, Wow, that actually worked out perfect. I'm gonna go to the other three Barbary states and tell them the same thing now. But of course there's gonna be a catch with that. You see, there's four Barbary states, but Morocco's okay. the only one that's actually truly independent and the other three are just subservient branches of the Ottoman Empire. So Thomas Jefferson and John Adams go to talk to the ambassador of Tripoli and they're like, hey, can all the Ottoman Barbary states leave our boats alone? At which point the ambassador informs them, absolutely not. You see, we're part of the Ottoman Empire. We don't need to listen to you. We're not scared of you guys. And it is our Look official ever. stance that, and I quote, it was written in the Quran that all nations which had not acknowledged the prophet were sinners who it was the right and duty of the faithful to plunder and enslave. Oh, wow. You know, Ooh. unless they give us money, of course. Everything's got a price, <laughs> apparently. So Thomas Jefferson is like, well, okay, we're going to war then. And that's when John Adams is like, whoa, 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 calm down. Let's just pay the tribute so that our ships can be fine. We already disbanded the Continental Navy after winning the Revolutionary War. We don't have a Navy to fight these guys. Okay. We just have to give them the money. So that's what happened. For the next eight to 10 years, America would oh, pay wow. tribute every year to these three remaining Barbary states. And every year they wanted more and more money. And eventually even that wasn't enough because- Alex That is the issue, isn't it? You're getting these deals and then suddenly it's like, oh, well, if you can afford to pay us that last year, you want a bit yeah. more. Because I suppose they also know they're starting to figure out every year how much it's going to cost to actually mm -hmm. go to war with them. So like, yeah, we're doing you yeah. a favor here. <laughs> Even though, I guess in the end, it turns out America doing them a favor because they could just make a military and wipe them out. Yeah. Which it sounds like they are going to do or at least stop them from touching the boats. Yeah. But um, yeah, they get, they get confident, these pirates, don't they? Geos yeah. began attacking American vessels anyways. Okay, if you're not picking up what I'm putting down, I'm trying to tell you that for the first time in American history, somebody has fucked with Wait. one of America's money and eventually even that wasn't enough because algiers began attacking american vessels in oh, okay you're not picking it. up what i'm putting down i'm trying to tell you that for the first time in american history somebody has fucked with one of america's boats and they're not immediately sorry about it yet the president at the time george washington goes to congress and pretty much tells them what's going to happen because at this point in time george washington is basically the king of america nobody actually knows if he's going to step down from presidency or not so he's like hey guess what you guys are going to pass the Naval Act of 1794, establishing the United States Navy. And at the very top of that document, it very clearly states that the purpose we are building the United States Navy is so that we can combat Algerine Corsairs, which is just a fancy word for state-funded pirates. Oh, yes, wow. I'm telling you that the founding document of the most powerful navy the world has ever Those seen at the top specifically crazy, states the sole reason for their creation is to hunt down and destroy pirates that had the audacity to fuck with one of America's ships. We've <laughs> nice officially man. entered the find out portion of the story. America immediately commissions the building of six enormous frigates covered in guns to go fight these pirates. Fast forward to when the frigates are done. It takes a couple years. It is now 1798. And George Washington has decided to step down from power, allowing for an election to happen. And we are now into the second president of America, John Adams. And John okay. Adams decides he would rather keep paying tribute. Disappointed! Oh, America just created the, the Navy, well. spent a million dollars creating all these frigates, and now John Adams isn't going to use them for their intended purpose. Mm -hmm. Obviously, a lot of people are upset, including his own vice president, 
Thomas Jefferson. So Thomas Jefferson, the vice president at the time, immediately begins campaigning to run against the sitting president oh. in the next election. And one of his biggest platforms is that he is going to go fight these pirates rather than pay them tribute. Okay. And his slogan and he for made, this is... He and became president, didn't he, Thomas Jefferson? Yeah, so I'm guessing he won the next yeah. election. I didn't know which... That's a bit awkward, isn't it? <laughs> Sorry, mate. Um, and then a lot of, that's, that's not the first time vice president has become president, is it? Because it has happened um, before. Biden... Wasn't Biden Obama's vice president? Yeah, but I don't think that was like Biden be like, oh, Obama, no, I'm gonna no, no, be no. yours. It, no, no, it just no. progressed but, into the world. But it's like it kind of, I guess it, it happens. It makes sense if you've got the credentials to be a president and you're vice. You're already learning the job a bit, aren't you? You, you kind of know the job because um, you've... the public know you a bit more, I guess, as well. Um, so that makes sense. But he was just straight up like. Oh yeah, I'm running yeah, against you next. <laughs> I don't like that you're not sorting these pirates out. <laughs> I quote, millions in defense before a cent in tribute. Okay, just so we're clear, Thomas Jefferson's platform for running for president is I'm going to spend millions of dollars in defense, which might as well be hundreds of billions of dollars at that point, because America no longer negotiates with terrorists. And I'm pretty sure my high school English teacher would refer to this as foreshadowing. So Thomas Jefferson <laughs> wins the election. The entire world finds out that he's going to be the third president of the United States of America. And then on March 4th, 1801, the day of his inauguration, he receives a letter from Yusuf Karmanali, the Pasha of Tripoli. If you don't know, okay. Pasha is like the dictator, the king, the president, the, the main dude in charge. And at this point, Thomas Jefferson, the guy who just ran an entire presidential campaign on, I'm going to go fight pirates, is thinking in his head, like, maybe this guy found out that I'm about to send a Navy over there to beat him up and he's going to send an apology. Maybe he wants to sign a peace treaty like Morocco did. This is already working out great. I might not even have to send my Navy over there. He opens the letter and Pasha Yusuf Karmanali has decided that he is going to poke the Pilgrim King because he is now demanding that because of the new administration, the United States owes him an extra $225,000 wow. in tribute. And Thomas Jefferson is pissed. What are you trying to get crazy with? I said, don't you know I'm local? Originally, Thomas Jefferson was going to have to go to Congress, get permission to activate the Navy, to send them over there to fight these pirates, but not now. He's so mad, we're activating the rainbow shortcut to ass whooping land, <laughs> and Pasha Yusuf is going to have some consequences immediately because wow. he's sending the Navy today. But like I, mean, I said, it takes... that is very, like, arrogant and kind of like, yeah, I'm going to... It is. But surely he would have heard... I know back then, news doesn't travel as fast, but you'd think... If that guy's just one presidency, yeah. what his mottos are. You'd think he'd have heard what his mottos are. Oh, he wants to go to war. So then him just go, oh, here you go. I want to yeah. look grand. Obviously, that's not going to work. No, but you'd think he'd know that. Yeah, you, you, you mean you'd think he'd know that, Which but obviously not. That maybe he's like, either either he doesn't know that. Yeah. And he's just like bl been blindsided by that. Or he's planning something. Yeah. And or he knows he won't get it. But, but yeah, he's but acting he, dumb. He could have just done, well, I'll throw it out there. If we go to war, we go to mm. war. If not, I get another 200 grand. Yeah. I guess maybe if you know. Yeah, yeah, let us know in the comments what you think like, of that. Like, uh, it's almost like the saying, like, uh, you don't know if you don't ask. Yeah, I don't know if you don't ask. Why not? He might be stupid enough to give me 200 grand, maybe. I don't know. It's a literal act of Congress to send the U.S. Navy over there on a military mission. So Thomas Jefferson is like, that's fine. We just won't send him on a military mission. Fill up one of our frigates with a bunch of gifts and peace <laughs> offerings for Pasha <laughs> Yusuf, and then give it a nice, healthy escort of other frigates to defend it and wow. send them on their merry way to deliver the gifts. Right after he gives the commander of the United States Navy the standing order that he is also to defend any American citizen or ship from any potential aggression. Not aggression, potential aggression. Potential if he aggression, thinks okay. that somebody else might be thinking about doing something aggressive. <laughs> take him out, take him down, do your... Your stuff. So the Navy sets sail. They're gone. They're in route. Thomas Jefferson's sitting in his office and he comes to the realization, man, I'm pretty sure these pirates are going to attack him. But if they don't, they're actually going to end up giving Pasha what's his nuts a bunch of these gifts. And I can't have it. So okay. he rips out the old quill and parchment. And he writes a letter back and sends that off. And that letter basically reads, hey, America's done giving you tribute for the rest of forever. F off. And obviously the letter makes it there first, at which point Pasha goes to the American consulate building and chops down the flagpole with the American flag on it, Ooh, which in that part good. of the world is how you declare war. So okay. the U.S. Navy shows up off the coast of the Barbary States. The pirates attack them because they've already declared war. The U.S. Navy defends themselves. Word gets back to America. Congress then is like, oh, hey, we're at war. We're going to go ahead and give 
Thomas Jefferson permission to use the United States Marine Corps at his discretion. And this there is why, go. to this day, the United States Marine Corps is the only branch of the U.S. military that can be sent and deployed anywhere in the world without congressional approval. So for the wow. next two years, the U.S. Navy and the Marine Corps set up a naval blockade and just go on a pirate hunting extravaganza <laughs> until extravaganza. October of 1803, when the USS Philadelphia would get hung up on an uncharted reef right off the coast of Tripoli. The okay. pirates seize this opportunity. They attack the USS Philadelphia, board it, take the crew hostage, and then over the next couple months, they were able to repair it enough to get it back into the harbor at Tripoli, where they oh, then anchored it in place I and used it. it as fixed artillery because it had way more guns than any other vessel they had. Cue our first main character, Stephen Decatur, the commander of the USS Enterprise. I mean, to be fair, I, I know it did get stuck, but the fact they managed to get on there, mm -hmm. actually get it working, move it, that's a lot of firepower mm -hmm. there. That, that is quite impressive for just pirates you yeah. know i mean i know it's 800 pirates but still it's quite impressive for them. unofficial flagship he decides that he's going to don his plot armor take the uss enterprise oh, out and acquire himself a pirate ship which he does he then takes that pirate ship and the uss enterprise and sails both of them to sicily where he hires five Sicilian mercenaries that know how to speak Arabic. Okay. They then sail back to Tripoli, where Decatur and 80 Marines are going to go below deck of this pirate ship, which has now been christened the USS Intrepid, as the five mercenaries are going to sail directly into the heart of the harbor, pretending to be Barbary pirates. Oh, they wow. then go directly to the USS Philadelphia. 80 Marines and Stephen Decatur run out, kill the entire crew of pirates that are on the USS Philadelphia and reclaim it. Unfortunately, oh. the USS Philadelphia is too damaged to actually be used as a ship ever again, at which point Stephen Decatur decides, fine, we're just going to burn the entire thing to the ground because if we can't have it, nobody can. Deprive the enemy of nice things. I'm pretty sure Sun Tzu said that. So that's exactly <laughs> what they do. They light the USS Philadelphia on fire. They're positive it can't be put out. And then they bounce. Not a single American is injured. And Stephen Decatur is hailed a hero nice because he has now led what is, no, in my opinion, yeah. America's first special operations mission. So now that that's taken care of, the problem yeah, that is... That is like mega like special ops stuff. Sneaking in. Hiring people, ambush them in their own ground. It's like ruin America check doing this. Yeah, and also check that it's done the job and then out of there before no one gets hurt. Out of there, the burn it down as well. That is proper special yeah. ops, isn't it? opinion america's first special operations mission so now that that's taken care of the problem at hand is that the crew of the uss philadelphia is still being held hostage by the barbary pirates Ooh, and they good. want a ton of money in exchange for them back however america no longer negotiates with terrorists and that's not an option cue our next two main characters William Eaton and Presley O'Bannon. And before okay. you ask, yes, Presley O'Bannon, as in the USS O'Bannon, the Fletcher-class destroyer from World War II that sank a Japanese submarine with potatoes. So oh, they wow. go in and they pitch their idea of how they're going to get the crew of the USS Philadelphia back, and it is by every definition, a special operations mission. Basically, they want to take themselves, two dudes, plus six Marines for a total of eight guys, and they're going to get dropped off in Egypt because in Egypt is Yusuf Karmali's brother that is living in exile because Yusuf kicked him out because he is technically the rightful heir of Tripoli. So oh. they're going to get that guy and all the buddies that are loyal to him, like 500 men, and then they're going to march them through the desert to Derna, where they are then going to use them to fight and take over the city and exchange the city for the crew of the USS Philadelphia. And upon hearing this ridiculous plan, the US military leadership is like, whoa, whoa, whoa. You want to take a small contingency of men, be dropped off in a foreign country, it meet up mental. with a rebel leader who already has a... Let's be a rebel leader as well. It sounds so like, why would they let you? Like, why would they let you and how is this going to work? ...contingency of men be dropped off in a foreign country, meet up with a rebel leader who already has a bunch of men, and then convince him that you're going to help him overthrow a current dictator, and then he can be the new dictator, and basically we're using other people to fight other people that we don't like to benefit us. And Presley O'Bannon and Eaton are like, yeah, that's, that's pretty much exactly it. And the government <laughs> is like, this is a terrific idea. I mean, we're probably never, ever going to do anything like this ever again. And we're not going to have an entire branch of special forces that specializes in it. Sorry. Anyways, that's exactly what they do. They get dropped off in Egypt. They track down Hamet. They're like, hey, you want to go overthrow your brother? Cool. Grab your guys. Let's go. Oh, wow. Along it actually the way, works. The Marines yeah. also picked up 50 Greek mercenaries as they all begin 
marching 500 miles through the Libyan desert That's to get a big back march. to the Tripolitan coast. And this march through the desert takes 50 days and it is a complete shit show because somewhere along the way they start running low on supplies and they have to start rationing. And then some people get mad. There's accusations because the Greek guys are Christian, Hamet's guys are Muslims. There's fighting amongst themselves. Yeah. And there's these eight Marines standing in the middle desperately trying to keep them from killing each other as they march through the desert. That's so a long time. 50 is. days. I found 10 hours a day mm -hmm. just marching. Yeah. Uh, 10 hours, 10 miles a day. Yeah, just mar day, marching. Yeah. That's still a lot of marching every it is day. a lot of marching. With, you're on a, rations as well. So. Yeah, you've got this massive army. You're eight guys in a foreign country, probably yeah. don't speak the language. Don't know what these guys are going to do. Low on rations. Everyone's getting stressed. That's, that's a yes. hard special operation yes. mission, isn't it? So despite multiple mutiny attempts and a ton of fights, the Marines were able to keep this group together enough to make it through the Libyan desert till they arrived at the coastal city of Bamba. Once they get there, they meet up with the USS Argus that gives them a bunch of supplies so they can start eating food again, and they give enough money to pay off the Greek mercenaries. Okay. Then... Eaton decides that he's going to send a letter over to the governor of Derna right next door. Because remember, we can't attack unless they're potentially aggressive. Okay. okay. So he sends a letter and is basically like, hey, I'm going to march my army through the middle of your town to go kill your boss on my way to Tripoli. Um, can I have some safe passage and maybe some food? The governor of Derna sends a letter back that says, my head or yours, which sounds... That's potentially aggressive enough. Yeah. So they begin making the plan for the ground attack. Hamet and his men are going to take the governor's palace, and the marines and the Greek mercenaries are going to take out the harbor fortress. But to do that, they're going to need a cannon from the USS Argus, so they're going to meet up with it, go get this cannon, and prepare for their attack. Okay. Cut back to Stephen Decatur. While all this has been happening, there's still been a naval battle in the Mediterranean the entire time, and Stephen Decatur is on an absolute rampage because Killing after pirates. he captured wow. his first pirate ship, he would receive word that his brother, James Decatur, had been mortally wounded by one of the pirate ship's captains, who was pretending to surrender before shooting his oh, younger brother. Oh, he's on a revenge Upon mission. Upon hearing this, Decatur immediately gives command of the... Yeah, he's on a revenge mission for his brother, and he is going on what it sounds like. Which, fair enough, do you know what I mean? Yeah. Especially when they're surrendering, and then they've done it as well. Yeah. Like, that must hurt him because that happened yeah. to his brother. Surrender before shooting his younger brother. Upon hearing this, Decatur immediately gives command of the new captured vessel to one of his men, leaves a couple guys with him, and takes off to track down this pirate ship that just killed his brother. So they chase down this pirate ship, they pull up right next to it, and before the crew has time to do any boarding procedures, you know, like break out the planks, tie some ropes to the other ship, all that stuff you see in the movies. Nah, Stephen Decatur jumps into the enemy ship and starts killing pirates immediately. What? Nine Marines seeing that happen are like, oh shit, we're doing this. So they jump <laughs> onto the go. pirate ship too and start throwing down, at which point the pirate ship veers off and breaks away from Decatur's ship. It is now nine Marines and Stephen Decatur versus over 30 pirates on wow. this vessel, and 30 is not going to be enough. Stephen Decatur kills multiple pirates, including the captain that had slain his brother, officially wow. avenging his brother's yeah, he got death, revenge. capturing that vessel as well but he is still absolutely furious that his brother died and he continues to go on a rampage wow. capturing another pirate ship and destroying three more over the coming weeks wow. cut back to the men on the ground eaton and o'bannon have been getting their battle plan ready this entire time they just had their men go get a cannon off the uss argus because they really really need this cannon if they're going to be able to pull off this mission so they're ready to attack. The U.S. Navy gets into formation and they are going to bombard the entire city of Derna while they launch this attack. Okay, Despite it's that, both sides. there's over 2,000 men loyal to Pasha Yusuf that are going to defend it. And they are That's heavily outnumbered. Okay. So Navy starts bombarding the shore. Hamet and his men take off to go attack the governor's palace. And Eaton, O'Bannon, the Marines, and the Greek mercenaries begin launching their attack on the harbor fortress. They open up with the initial cannon fire, which is going to be vital to be able to break through the enemy lines and establish their foothold. They fire the cannon. As they go to reload and fire it again, they realize that they had accidentally forgot to take the ramrod out of the cannon and shot that at the enemy too. Now the cannon's completely out and they're kind of like, oh shit, what do we oh, do? Broken. What do we do? And Presley O'Bannon just charges into battle as the other Marines follow behind him and the Greek mercenaries behind them. They attack so quickly and so violently that they're able to overrun the entire enemy fortress before anybody really knows what's going on. I mean, you know what? Okay. Sometimes plans don't always go, but sometimes the new plan works out better. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? They had to improvise, they improvised, and they went too quick. If yeah. they'd have waited, they kind of got them in. They might, might not have ever done it. So sometimes 
If you don't go to plan, it's not always a bad thing. Plan B sometimes is as good as plan A. Yeah, exactly. Just think on your feet, I guess. ...violently that they're able to overrun like the entire did. enemy fortress before anybody really knows what's going on. And Presley O'Bannon becomes the first American ever to raise the Star Spangled Banner over a foreign battlefield. Oh, wow. This battle, the taking of the Tripolitan coastal city of Derna, is enshrined in Marine Corps history in the Marine Corps hymn with the line from the halls of Montezuma to the shores of Tripoli. And it wow. is also where the Marine Corps would get their first first nickname ever because the seven marines present for this battle fought so hard and so violently that they simply became known as the leathernecks referring to the leather collar that they wore around wow. their neck to protect it from slashes from pirate swords wow. so you see them them. getting beaten back and are forced to retreat to tripoli at which point the marines the greeks and hamet and his men all consolidate figure out what happened hamet and his men were able to take over the governor's palace and after the taking of the city of derna hamet awards his very own sword to Presley O'Bannon as a gift for how wow. valiantly he fought in battle. And this is the Mameluke sword, the same sword that is on the Marine Corps uniform today. Wow. So now Yusuf consolidates his military, sends an enormous army back to Derna to try to take it back over, and they're kind of just sitting on the outskirts of the city, waiting for the right moment to attack. Eaton and O'Bannon are writing correspondence to the U.S. military in the chain of command, like, hey, we took this entire city with like eight Marines, give us some reinforcements, we're gonna go take Tripoli we'll take next, countries. and then we'll just overthrow this entire country. Yeah. This goes on for over a month, and they defend the city multiple times from attacks from Yusuf's men, and eventually, Eaton receives a letter informing him that he is to stand down and just leave. Because oh. American diplomat Tobias Locke has struck up a deal with Yusuf Carmenali. And apparently he struck up this deal with absolutely nobody's permission. Because the deal is America is going to pay Yusuf Carmenali, the pirate king, $60,000. And in exchange, we are going to receive the USS Philadelphia back. As well as a peace treaty that they are going to leave American ships alone from now on. So yeah, everybody's pretty pissed off about it. I mean, they are paying 60 grand, but we get the ship back. It's just one of them, is that peace treaty like worth it? Do you know what I mean? It's like, is it going to actually be trusted upon? Especially back then. Yeah. Well, I guess we'll find out, but yeah. it's kind of like, they didn't want to negotiate them, they negotiated obviously behind everyone's mm -hmm. back. But um, yeah, interesting. Either they are going to leave American ships alone from now on. So yeah, everybody's pretty pissed off about it from Thomas Jefferson, Presley O'Bannon, William Eaton, Stephen Decatur. They're all furious that we are now giving $60,000 to this pirate king as opposed to overthrowing his entire city of Tripoli or at a minimum using the fact that they're holding Derna and use that as leverage to yeah. exchange. But whatever, the war's over, I guess. For now. So the peace treaty was signed in 1805. Now, fast forward seven years, 1812. The War of 1812 happens. Okay, if you don't know, the yep. War of 1812, there's more to it than this, but the reason that it started is that Great Britain wanted to have more control over the seas and trade because America was getting too I mean, let us know on that, because I don't know much about the 1812 war. Mm -hmm. I just know from these reactions are mostly about the 1812 war obviously you guys want it as well um let us know in the comments below where we should look into it a bit more yeah if there's any good videos or something as well because america was no longer getting attacked by pirates because we just beat them in a war now too so Great Britain launches another war against America. During this war, they encourage the Barbary pirates to start attacking American vessels again. Oh, and honestly, it works out pretty good for the pirates, at least for a little while, because the American Navy is too busy to worry about them because their hands are full with the British Navy. Fast forward two years, eight months later, the War of 1812 ends. Now, luckily for the Barbary pirates, pirates yeah. Thomas Jefferson is no longer president at this point. We are on to America's fourth president. Let me check my notes here. Um... James Madison. If you don't know, <laughs> James Madison is one half of what is referred to as the forefathers dynamic duo. Oh. And the other half is his best friend of all time, Thomas Jefferson. Okay, and I don't know if you've figured this out go. yet at this point in the story, but Thomas Jefferson hates pirates. So sitting president James Madison, being the homie that he is, looks over oh, at now Commodore Stephen Decatur and says, Go get him, tiger. <laughs> <laughs> he then proceeds to assemble the largest U.S. naval fleet ever at this point in time and sails directly to the Barbary Coast. He then immediately tracks down Algiers' flagship, the Mashuda, takes it out, captures over 400 members of its crew, wow. and the ship itself. He then proceeds to take all of his gunboats directly to Algiers, park them in the port, and say, here's the deal. You're going to surrender, and you're never going to collect tribute from anyone ever again, or... I'm going to overthrow your entire country. Obviously, they take the first option, at which point Decatur's like, okay, cool, next order of business. You're also going to pay me back for all the U.S. merchandise that you plundered during the War of 1812. And wow. they're like, okay, 
Here you go. That's a they lot give of money. It to him. He then proceeds to sail his fleet next door to Tunis and tell them the exact same thing, ordering them to sign a peace treaty, never raid an American vessel again, and then collects a bunch of money. He then sails them next door again to Tripoli and does the exact same thing, collects all this money, gets the peace treaties, the Barbary pirates never mess with America ever again, Decatur and his fleet sail back home, and he tells the government what happened. The American government it. is blown away at the results that Decatur was able to achieve when asked how he managed to not only get peace treaties without too much violence, but also get a bunch of money and concessions on top of it. All Decatur said was, peace was achieved through the mouth of our cannons, at which point he was given the nickname the conqueror of the Barbary pirates. Wow. And with the rest of the world seeing a new country in its infancy stand up for itself against the Barbary pirates and winning, they would start doing it too. And everybody started fighting back and quit paying tribute to the Barbary pirates. And in the coming years, they would fade into nothing as their 300 year reign of terror had come to an end. 300 years so in is a long time. The moral of the story is please, for the love of God, do not mess with America's boats. <laughs> Thank you for watching. Best way to support the channel is go buy some merch over at thefatelectrician.com. Quack bang, out. Right, we're gonna wait until the end. And that is part one of the origin story of how America became the world police. <laughs> Give you a hint, part two ends after the Korean War when NATO gets founded. <laughs> <laughs> there we go, the extra little bit. So that was good, wasn't it? It was good. Smash that if you enjoyed, guys. Smash the subscribe button. And uh, I was literally just thinking, actually, before that, like, this was basically the start of America, the Navajo country, and just straight away, they're like, yeah, we know, we're not messing with you. And then everyone yeah. right the rest of the world was like, oh, this is an up. We get in behind them because they're just the powerful ones. Mm -hmm. And obviously, they weren't as powerful then, but it's just growing and growing. Yeah. And nowadays, it is literally just you guys. Uh, on top on top easily and it's a good job with friends enjoy that yeah it was really interesting fact let's just good as always smash the like button guys smash the subscribe button and watch the video have a fantastic day and we'll see you legends in the next one peace